Welcome to MA Science, where we curate knowledge from the best in MA to continuously improve. If you're interested in keeping up with the latest from MA Science, subscribe to our free newsletter at mascience.com. Every week, we share highlights from interviews, invitations to events, MA role openings, and other resources as we build the greatest community of forward thinking MA practitioners. Again, that's mascience.com. I'm your host, Kisan Patel. CEO and founder of MA Science. Joining me today is Leslie Adamo, Vice Chair Tax Group at Lowenstein Sandler. Lowenstein Sandler is a national law firm with more than 300 lawyers working from five offices across New York, Palo Alto, New Jersey, Utah, and DC. Today we're going to talk about tax considerations and MA. Before we kick things off, a quick little disclaimer that the information provided in this podcast is intended for a general audience and is not a substitute for the advice of competent counsel. This content reflects the personal views and opinions of the participants and no attorney-client relationship is created by this podcast. Now that we got that out of the way, we have some big exciting news for our m and science community. I wanted to announce this with Leslie since your firm, Lowenstein Sandler, is partnering up with us to host the first M&A Science Fair. We're excited to have everyone. This will be our first conference that we're hosting in New York City on October 5th. This will not be like any other M&A conference you've been to for three reasons. One, it's by invitation only, so we keep it 90% in-house corporate M&A practitioners, guaranteed high-quality networking. You can request an invite on our website. Two. No boring panels. You don't learn anything meaningful from panels. So instead, we're using collaborative formats where the participants drive the topics. Three, the theme of this conference is what's your hypothesis? Bring your challenges, problems, and workshop them with your peers to bring back practical solutions you can apply to your practice. Visit our website, mascience.com to learn more. Leslie, how do you feel about hosting a conversation on tax strategies at the fair? Absolutely. Let's do it. If you like today's conversation, Leslie has a course on the MA Science Academy portal that dives deeper into MA tax. Let's kick things off with the introduction on your background, Leslie. Sure. Um, I am a partner at Lowenstein Sandler, and I work closely with clients and my corporate colleagues to understand my clients' business objectives and help ensure that transactions are structured tax efficiently. So I provide counsel on a variety of transactional tax matters, including M&A deals, uh, partnership issues, individual individual tax issues arising at the federal, state, and international levels. Um, I also uh, advise on joint ventures, fund formation, and various tax issues specific to startup businesses and their founders. I do a lot of work with blockchain transactions, qualified opportunity funds, bankruptcy-related issues, and derivative transactions. Um, And prior to joining this firm, I was at another large law firm where I focused on tax planning matters for high net worth individuals, multinational corporations, and investment funds. Can you give me a sense of the range of complexity when it comes to taxation and M&A? Tax issues in M&A can get very complex very quickly. Sometimes it's not so complex. Sometimes it can be somewhat straightforward, but that's usually not the case. Uh, The reason being is that the most tax optimized structure for the buyer is not always the best structure for the seller and vice versa. So the buyer and the seller and an M&A deal are often at odds in determining how they'd like to have the transaction structured and what would be best for each of them. Many of the complexities are informed by the different tax structures of the buyer and sellers. Are they C corporations, S corporations, LLCs, individuals, right? And then whether the consideration in the deal is going to be all cash, uh, cash and equity. Is there going to be an earnout, right? Some cash or equity paid later. Is everything going to be paid up front? Um, Also, it's not only U.S. federal income taxes that need to be 
uh, considered, you also have to think about state and local taxes. And if there's any foreign jurisdictions or individuals involved, you also have to think about cross-border taxes. So it can get very complex very quickly, and it's not necessarily the size of the deal that determines the complexity. Uh, my most complex deal was a $750,000 tax-free reorganization. <laughs> So it, it's not size dependent. Uh, it's more dependent on these other factors. That's interesting. I wouldn't think so. So you, we have the structure of the entities, the structure of the terms of the deal, the type of payments, cash equity, et cetera, and then a good old government entities and both federal, well, federal, state, and local level, and yeah. probably some other little things that could come up. Um. How let's talk about from from the beginning. If we're walking through an M and A deal, how early? And everybody, I know, I know your answer is going to be <laughs> already. But I, I, if you give me the details of like how early should you start thinking about tax from the buy side, then also from the sell side? Yes. Yeah, so no matter what, on both side sides, you it's best to have tax involved when you're negotiating the term sheet or the letter of intent stage. So before you're actually doing the definitive documents, you definitely want some tax input prior to the term sheet or the letter of intent getting signed. Um, lots of times a seller will uh, benefit from having a tax advisor look at their structure when they're considering whether they might want to put themselves up for sale or, or they're considering a, a financing transaction so that a tax advisor can look at the structure, their short-term and long-term goals, like growth or monetization strategies before discussions happen regarding those transactions, because setting yourself up for success before you decide to put yourself up for sale can save you a lot of money in the sale process or the financing process. I want to pause on that one because on the buy side, I'm a deal happy person. I, I would jump on getting an LOI signed and then give you a call. But what you're referencing is bringing the tax expert before signing an LOI. How often does that happen? I'm curious because you work as external counsel. Do you yeah. often see sophisticated buyers that are doing that? Or do you run across a lot of situations where people are, hey, here's our signed LOI. Let's let's yeah. take this I'd say the buyer often will have the upper, you know, sometimes will have the upper hand at the LOI stage from what I see a lot in my practice, because a lot of times they're a bigger company and they already have a, a kind of a playbook. They know what they'd like to do. They'd like to go buy some assets usually. Um, and they also know they'd like to have some contingent consideration and consideration that's contingent on not only maybe revenue, but maybe also certain key employees staying on, et cetera, right? Like a lot of times the buyer is setting some of those terms that could have some negative tax consequences for the seller later on down. What I see happen more often is not so much that the buyer has an issue because of what's in the LOI, but the seller does. You know, sellers are not often as big as the buyers uh, that they're being sold to. And sometimes they're not as, uh, you know, they don't have tax advisors lined up at the term sheet stage. Um, and some of the terms in the term sheet could be really disadvantageous for the seller and hard to go back and negotiate and renegotiate on. Um, so, at the very least, we we would love to have a seller reserve for restructuring in light of taxes in the term sheet if they have no tax advisor, so they have another bite at the apple, um, like something like the transaction will be structured to be tax optimal for the seller or something like that, or tax optimized. But it's best if a seller really has a tax advisor involved. On the seller side, how early is ideal for thinking through or bringing in a tax expert? Yeah, on the seller side, I'd love to see it before they start negotiating a term sheet, right? A lot of times a seller needs to do some restructuring to get themselves into the best structure for a sale process. And it's great if you could start thinking about what needs to happen ahead of time. And it's great if a seller knows whether it's going to be best for them to sell their assets or their stock right? And knows whether if they're going to sell their assets, for example, there'll be a big tax drag so they can start negotiating for a gross up on the purchase price to compensate them for the tax drag for the optimal 
if, if the buyer is going to insist on a, an optimal structure for the buyer, right? But if you don't start negotiating for something like a tax gross up at the term sheet stage, it's very hard to get it in later as a seller. Both scenarios, best is earlier, the better before I yes. Yes, definitely earlier is better. You had a good point too on the buy side that a lot of times you can see companies that are pretty mature because they've done multiple acquisitions and they've got a strategy in place or a sense of direction where to go. But for that first time buyer, I think it might be a new concept because even you mentioned it. I didn't think about having somebody involved before an LOI and would even think that's a little awkward because you're so focused on getting the deal terms locked down and getting the seller to say yes. Totally. But tax is one of those areas where you really can see, you know, tax cash savings are real, right? So when you're a buyer, you want to really think about what's my monetization strategy going to be later on and what's the best way for me to own this business. Um, for a buyer, it's usually best if the buyer can get a basis step up in the assets right, that it's buying. So a basis step up can provide a tax shield for the buyer in the form of depreciation or amortization deductions. Uh, and so a buyer oftentimes is already thinking about that, that they'd like to get that basis step up. And so that when they're doing their modeling, determining what purchase price they should offer, buyers should be thinking about taxes. What will the tax drag be on this uh, investment or what will the tax shield be that I can get from, from the basis step up? Um, the buyer also needs to think about post-acquisition structuring, right? Like if the buyer has to date only invested in flow-through businesses or only bought assets, buying stock of a C-Corp uh, might be not advantageous for them, right? Like they might not be able to incorporate a business that's in a C-Corp form well into their structure if it's all through pass-throughs otherwise, where if you have a corporate buyer, maybe buying a C-Corp isn't so bad for their overall structure. So there there are um, definitely tax issues that buyers should be mindful of when structuring uh, a, you know, a, a transaction and thinking about the optimal structure uh, and tax efficiencies. I think buyers also have to be very mindful, obviously, of not acquiring any tax liabilities associated with the business for the period prior to their ownership of the company, right? So a buyer is also thinking about do I want to ask for a tax indemnity, right? What will that look like? Do I want to have um, any special covenants regarding taxes and cleanup matters? Tax diligence is really, really important, right? If there are major issues identified in tax diligence, sometimes you're going to want, the buyer's going to want a special indemnity put aside to make sure there's enough cash to cover the tax liabilities or certain remediation measures or a special escrow um, or maybe go out and get tax insurance for certain known tax risks, right? There, there are a number of uh, ways to deal with those issues, but that's something buyer is always thinking about. This is good stuff. We got structure the deal, want to be more asset forward and think about um, also the post-close structure and what that's going to make an impact on, on the tax structure overall. And then the tax liabilities, I wish we were going to talk more about what are other con tax considerations for buyers? Yeah, if a buyer sees, let's say they see a C corporation target, right, that has a lot of net operating losses, they might think about how to price the use of those into the deal, right? Like, will they get the benefit of that tax asset post closing? Um, that's something a buyer might be thinking about. Also, a buyer is often thinking about key employees, right? Uh, is there a key employee or a seller that they want to keep on post-closing? So will there either be a rollover, so some equity compensation in the deal, uh, and how to provide that type of uh, equity compensation or incentive equity in a way that's tax efficient for both the buyer and the key employee or the, the rollover seller? Um, so those are also issues that buyers are often thinking about. This is good. We got some pretty key areas. I want to take apart the tax liability one because I'm, I, I, I want to understand on that we see companies buy startups pretty often and there's all this um, obligations you have, especially as more companies are becoming, what's the word, uh, distributed. 
And now you have employees in multiple states, which you register in those multiple states, of which you're essentially signing up to pay state taxes. And then that's this overhead that tends to be usually either catch up game or, and I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm curious what your lens is on it, but there's, I, I can easily see there being some inherent um, dues there. I don't know. What, what do you typically see around those situations? Cause that's the first thing I think of, which is startups don't really take care of that stuff till they get to a certain size. So if you're a larger company buying a startup, you probably can look under the rug and identify some stuff pretty quickly right there. Yeah, for our startup clients, so SaaS businesses, um, software as a service business, a lot of times the big tax issue that comes up in diligence when the buyer's doing diligence on the target company is that they have not complied with all their sales tax obligations in the various states. Um, And so oftentimes buyer identifies that as a key issue and asks for some sort of uh, escrow or purchase price deduct or remediation measures says like, you know, post-closing, we're going to do voluntary disclosure in certain states or something like that. And there's negotiation around those issues. Um, As seller, you know, you don't want, after you do your deal, especially if you're not rolling, you want to be able to walk away somewhat, right? You don't want to be worrying about tax liabilities trailing you forever. And so there's a lot of negotiation around what that indemnification will look like, how long it will be out, you know, how long it will last for, like what's the end date uh, for the indemnification. And sometimes also there's negotiations around which states will the company go become in compliance with? Is it all 50 states that to go? To usually not. Usually there's some identified key states. Um, and sometimes the issue, honestly, is that the law is still evo- evolving and there's not really a right answer. Like it's a gray area whether compliance is necessary in a state. And then the buyer and the seller are negotiating about whether there should be a compliance in that state and what they will do with respect to that specific state. Um, but we do see a lot of sales tax negotiations and you know compliance issues come up in m a deals um for for our startup clients and then i mean state and local issues have become even more widespread in the past couple of years because of covid and all the remote working remote workers also cause nexus for for companies in these variety in various states right so all of a sudden a company that might have had employees only in like one or two states might now have employees in 25 states um, and have tax obligations in each of those states or tax reporting obligations. Um, and so we're seeing issues uh, around state and local compliance because of remote workers also becoming a big hot ticket item. So when we're preparing a seller, like a company for sale, we're often telling the client, these are going to become issues because the buyer is going to ask in diligence about your sales tax, your sales tax compliance and your um, state income tax compliance more generally because of remote workers. Um, What have you done so far? Let's start thinking about how we're going to respond to those questions. Should we on our own right now engage a nexus study to be done? Um, so we can get in front of it because buyers going to come with, you know, their accounting firm to do diligence. Should we as seller do our own diligence basically on ourselves to figure out where our weaknesses are? Right. I, the way you speak through it as a buyer, should I be looking at that specifically where their employee base is and then already getting a pretty early sense of the lift on the tax liability and the example of having in two states versus 25? Yeah, buyers should definitely be doing be doing diligence on that item. Um, I, it is very commonly one of the items that buyers are doing diligence on. Not only are they looking usually at where the workers are located, because remember, there's going to be some post transaction and integra- integration into the buyer structure, right? So they need to know this anyways. But oftentimes, they're also looking at are the employees correctly characterized as employees versus independent contractors or vice versa, which is another kind of related hot ticket item on diligence that often comes up is uh, classification or misclassification, I'd say, of uh, employees. So and then, and then in terms of the way to minimize the risk around this is 
I'd either put an indemnity or hold some funds in escrow is typically the main practices. Right. So what you will always see in M&A deals, right, are tax representations, just like all the other representations that you have in a deal. The company's also repping that it paid its taxes and filed its tax returns correctly, um, that it withheld all the payroll taxes it needed to withhold, which goes to this misclassification issue. Um, the seller can schedule against those reps, right? If they have knowledge that they can't make any of the reps that they are being asked to make, they'll schedule against them. Buyers usually also will ask for a pre-closing tax indemnity, which is an indemnity against all pre-closing taxes of the target. Um, there's lots of a negotiation around what that will look like. Sometimes it's very fulsome and it covers like all tax liabilities known or unknown. Um, and it doesn't ever expire. So if a tax issue ever comes up for the pre-closing tax period, this indemnity lives on forever. Sometimes you'll see a deal have no tax indemnity and just have rep and warranty insurance, right? And rep and warranty insurance will just cover breaches of the reps. And sometimes also a pre-closing tax indemnity if there is one. The issue is that rep and warranty insurance very rarely will cover any known tax risks. So if any taxes were identified on the diligence schedule or were um, otherwise identified in due diligence that the buyer did in like a diligence report, the rep and warranty insurance policy usually excludes all of those tax items. So the buyer will either have no indemnification for those items if they don't have otherwise an indemnification against the sellers, or if the sellers have negotiated so that they only are on the hook for whatever rep and warranty insurance doesn't cover, the sellers need to know it doesn't cover any of the tax items that have been identified. So they're pretty much on the hook for all the tax items. Um, you can also get special tax insurance, which is a special product to cover known tax risks. I don't see that as often in, in M&A deals, but that's also a possibility as buyer. Um, and then sometimes you see deals structured as like public style deals, just there's no reps and warranties for anything, no, no surviving reps or tax indemnity. So that just means it's like walk away. Um, that, I see that less what... often because, uh, you know, most of my practice is not public deals or public style deals, but. That, that's what I'd negotiate as a seller, is an as, okay, as is sale. Yes. I think most of my sellers would love to negotiate a walkaway deal. Um, not, not happening don't see that quite often. So uh, as a buyer, we're looking at this company that's got uh, 25 employees spread across. We know they haven't been paying any of their sales taxes. When we get our reps and warranties, which is becoming more and more of, of the go-to, they're very much likely going to exclude knowing that there's these liabilities still out there. Yes. Yeah. Anything that has been identified as an issue in diligence or on the schedules is pretty much always excluded from the rep and warranty insurance. And then the question is, who holds the bag, right? Is it sellers have agreed to indemnify for anything not covered by rep and warranty insurance? Or is it that sellers have not provided any indemnification? So buyer then is on the hook for those pre-closing taxes. And okay. that's just a point. That covers our uh, dues to Uncle Sam. When we think about, we mentioned before of uh, the structure with leaning towards an asset sale as a buyer to get benefits of depreciation and things like that. What are the circumstances where you would favor a stock sale as a buyer? Yeah, stock, a uh, buyer might want to buy stock instead of assets. And I'm thinking of a C Corp specifically if the company has a lot of net operating losses, right? And there are limitations on the ability of a buyer to use net operating losses, but um, that's one, and we can talk about that in a minute, but that, that's one time a buyer might favor a stock purchase or same with like tax credits, like R&D tax credits or whatever. Um, another reason is because maybe buyer has looked at their model and it's just the tax shield from depreciation is not a major factor in how they're looking at the success of the deal. Maybe they're a C corp and just buying stock in another C corp where that company, the target company, will just consolidate with their structure they already have, um, does not create a tax drag, and that that's an acceptable structure. Or maybe maybe buyers um, a corp a C corporation wants to do an all stock deal, like a, a big tax free. Uh, transaction and doing stock for stock 
would be totally acceptable. So there are a number of times that buyer would be totally fine um, buying stock. And sometimes seller just, if they are a C-Corp, will refuse to do an asset sale because it's so tax inefficient for the sellers um, to structure, if, if the target company is a C-Corp, to, to have the deal structured as an asset sale. So it just might be that the sellers are just not going to agree to do a, you know, a stock sale. Oh, sorry. I guess it goes back to being an asset purchase. But yeah, that, that's an issue that can come up that lands you back into a stock purchase uh, for the deal structure. Acquiring losses. What What's the limitations there? Because I, I like the idea of buying a bankrupt company with millions and millions of dollars of loss carry forward, to carry forward. You like that idea and so do a lot of other people, which is why the IRS shut down <laughs> the real ability to do that. Uh, they did not like the idea of, of taxpayers be, being able to traffic in net operating losses or shell companies that had a bunch of losses. So they enacted um, a code provision that limits the ability of uh, buyers of shell loss companies to use the losses going forward. And you'll hear people talk about 382 limitations. And a 382 limitation is this limitation. Net operating losses of a corporation we will become limited if shareholders increase their ownership in the corporation by 50% over a three-year period. So if a corporation completely changes hands or a majority of its stock is sold, the ability of the net operating losses to be used are limited. Um, net operating loss carry forwards generally are useful because you can use them to offset like 80% of taxable income. But if this ownership change occurs, the 382 rules provide that the loss limitation for any year after the change of ownership is an amount equal to the value of the company on the date of the change of ownership multiplied by the long-term tax exempt rate, which is very low, subject to certain adjustments. And so what this means in layman's terms is the ability to use net operating loss carry forwards is severely limited when there's the change of ownership of a C corporation. And so it's hard to like quote traffic and losses. I don't like that law. I don't, I guess, <laughs> a whoever, lot of people do not like that law. Whoever passed it, it's very anti- entrepreneurial capitalism. I don't know. I don't want to get into that. But <laughs> well, and another question people ask all the time is, well, if I buy the assets, can I get the losses too, like as a tax asset of the C corporation? And the answer is no, you can't like buy net operating losses. But that's also a question we get a lot. Um, what can happen though, is if a company has a lot of net operating losses, the sellers might be amenable to doing an asset sale because the corporate level gain would be shielded by the net operating losses. There'd be no tax at the corporate level and then the cash should come out just subject to the one level of tax. So there is sometimes um, a benefit that still can be had to having losses in a C corporation in a sale transaction. A lot of it sounds like you want to communicate that to the seller as why the structure is going to be good overall for the deal. Yeah, it it's something that often comes up. I have yet to do a deal where the losses in the C corporation have been big enough where it actually makes sense for a seller to agree to an asset sale. But theoretically, it's a very nice transaction to think about. What do you typically see there? Is it always combined into one or they're running it as a subsidiary? What are the yeah, it totally depends on what the buyer's doing, right? So post-transaction integration is very much a function of who the buyer is and what the buyer is looking to do with this investment. So obviously, if you have like a fund that's just purchasing this company as a portfolio company and not looking to have it be part of a roll-up, um, they might think of it more as a standalone investment and ask the management team to roll a little bit or stay on and run the business for them. You see on the other side, big strategic investors, right? A big company that's maybe thinking they want to buy this target company and operate it as part of their overall business. They see it as adding something they don't currently have. In that circumstance, sometimes you'll see they really just want the business, the, the assets. They don't really want the people. Sometimes they want the people too. Um, when they want the people too, there's often negotiations around 
who will run what, what level of, you know, how autonomous will the company be? Um, and some of that can come back to taxes when thinking about earnouts, right, and contingent deal consideration um, and how that will be measured and paid out and how uh, to, for the sellers, what they're thinking about is how do I get uh, as much of that as possible paid to me as long-term capital gain, like the rest of my deal consideration versus as ordinary income, like compensation. When does the case shape for creating a holding company to house these multiple entities? Because I'm trying to get a sense of the plus and minus that you may have between companies. And then that kind of puts you in an odd spot as well. Yeah. So for buyer, that's really dependent. This, I guess this goes to pre-transaction structuring considerations for the buyer. The buyer really should be thinking when they're thinking about how they want to, you know, the best structure from for them from a tax perspective, where they want the target company to sit in their overall structure and whether they do need to reorganize um, and whether it makes sense if they, let's say they're a foreign company and they have a U.S. subsidiary already, should that U.S. sub buy this company or should it sit under the foreign holding company, right? Or if it's an asset purchase, um, should one of their existing businesses buy the assets or should they form a new holding company for those assets? So that's all just very dependent on buyer structure and ultimate um, monetization goals with respect to the acquisition. You added the international component really made it complex because. Uh... Yes. The international component makes it very, very complex. Um, as I think most people know, the U S seeks to tax worldwide income where it can. So um, you do want to make sure, especially if you have a foreign buyer that you are not going to subject them to unnecessary U S taxes and so um, it's really wise for a foreign buyer in particular to get U.S. tax advice prior to buying any U.S.-based businesses, which most do. Okay. A lot of stuff to think through on structure-wise post-acquisition. Um, the case around employee, because we may buy a founder business, keep them around and put them on some kind of compensation plan where they can earn equity in the combined organization. Um, and then we also have a lot of retainers, uh, retention offers that um, would inclu include some equity component. Are there any specific considerations around those kind of structures? Yeah. So one issue that we see fairly commonly is you'll have key employees who are also equity holders of the target company. And oftentimes what the buyer seeks to do is subject some of their deal consideration to contingencies, like all the other investors get all their deal consideration up front, or maybe a piece up front and a piece later, but the key employees only get their later piece if they're still employed right? Or they've been employed for a certain period of time. They almost have to vest into it or, or reverse vest out of it. Um, and you have to be very careful because generally deal consideration can receive long-term capital gains. Uh, and we can talk about seller structuring in a minute, but what you want to be careful about is that none of that seller consideration turn, you don't want to turn any of it into compensation income by subjecting it to contingencies like retained employment. And so if there are any of those types of contingencies or um, additional complexities that come into play, you do need to talk to a tax advisor on the sales side to make sure that you're not um, really disadvantaged by agreeing to those conditions. Because as a buyer, I'd, I'd very likely do that. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of buyers try to do that. And, but, you know, a lot of comp, uh, a lot of experienced buyers are very. They understand the tax issues that can come up for employees when some of their deal consideration is sub subject to contingencies, and oftentimes they're willing to work with seller counsel on trying to help structure that contingent consideration in a way that's tax efficient for the seller, but it can become a really, really major negotiating point. And this is often a point that comes up in term sheets. If the seller is supposed to be receiving equity in the buyer um, or supposed to stay on and retain equity in the target company, it's very important that the seller talk to a tax advisor and make sure that is structured tax efficiently. So the seller has tax deferral on the equity portion of the consideration. You don't wanna be a seller who receives 
equity consideration for your equity in the target, but have to pay tax because <laughs> you won't have the cash to pay the taxes on that portion. Right. What goes into that? So <clears throat> the seller has a whole host of other uh, tax efficiency goals in mind that they're thinking about when doing an M&A transaction, right? So usually the seller's main goal is to pay as little aggregate tax as possible on their sale proceeds. So that really means that they want to structure the transaction so there's one level of tax on the cash. They also want their deal consideration to be long-term capital gains, not ordinary income. And again, they don't want to pay tax if they are getting any equity for their equity, right? So those are the, the main goals the seller has and how to structure efficiently for all of those goals is really dependent on the seller structure. So if the seller is a C-Corp, it's generally always the case that it's most tax efficient for the seller just to sell their C-Corp stock. This is one level of tax on that sale. It's usually long-term capital gain. If a buyer requested a seller to that was a C-Corp to instead sell its assets, it could be very tax inefficient for the seller shareholder because there's ta corporations have tax paid at the corporate level, the entity level, and there's tax again when the cash comes out of the business. So there's two levels of tax on that type of, of transaction, which is why it's generally not the case that sellers who have a C-Corp will agree for the C-Corp to sell its assets in, in the transaction. It's usually always a stock sale. S-Corps, right, are a flow-through entity, although they're a type of corporation. And interesting with an S-Corp, again, if you sell the stock of an S-Corp, the seller shareholders have one level of tax on that gain. Usually it's long-term capital gain because it's just depending on the holding period in their stock. If an S-Corp sells its assets, it's usually only one level of tax because it's a flow-through entity, except there's certain states that don't follow the federal income tax rules for S-Corps, and they actually also impose entity-level tax on that gain. Also, if an S-Corp sells its assets, some of the gain might be ordinary income rather than long-term capital gain. Um. There until so until very recently, it was almost always the case that for an, shareholders of an S corp, it was more tax efficient for them to sell the stock of the S corp than its assets. Recently, like in the past year, year and a half, two years, there's been a whole host of new rules that people call the PTET tax regime, so pass through entity tax regime, where certain states have enacted rules that basically allow. S corps and tax partnerships like LLCs to pay state taxes on behalf of their individual owners at the entity level. And then the share, the equity holders get a deduction against their federal taxes for the state level, state taxes paid. It's like a workaround to the salt, the, the lack of the salt deduction that is currently um that, that we currently have. So to get around not being able to deduct state taxes against federal taxes, generally these PTET regimes were enacted. And so now, whenever we have a, a seller that is an S corp or a tax partnership, you actually need to do modeling based on all of the state tax states that are uh, implicated in the transaction to determine whether the offset from the PTET regimes is greater than the savings by doing an equity sale. And so now where it used to almost always be the case that for an S-Corp target, an, an equity sale was the best. Sometimes we're actually seeing asset sales be more tax efficient, which is just a very big change from what we used to used to see. Um, and that again could change if, if the SALT deduction cap is lifted. LLC which are generally tax partnerships, right? And tax partnerships, and I'm going to use the term LLC interchangeably with partnership to mean the same thing. Um, generally, the sale of uh, equity or assets from an LLC is subject to one level of tax. So whether you, you, you structure it as an entity, uh, an equity sale or an asset sale, th there won't be two levels of tax. And Likewise, when a partner of a partnership or a member of an LLC sells its equity, certain of 
the long-term capital gains is recharacterized as ordinary income, it's something called the hot asset rules. So generally inventory items and depreciation recapture are recharacterized as ordinary income. Um, if an LLC or a partnership sells its assets, they're also some ordinary income. But now again, because of the PTET regime, if an LLC sells its assets, there could be the benefit of these, uh, the ability to deduct state taxes against federal taxes on the gain, which could be a big tax saving. So again, there's a need now to model out what is better when uh, you're a seller uh, and you hold equity in an LLC, whether you should be selling the assets or, or the equity would be more tax efficient. And the buyer can receive basis step up um, in an LLC transaction, whether equity or assets are sold. So there's a lot more flexibility in structuring. Leslie, my notebook is one big blur right now. <laughs> so much. Who's got the leverage in negotiating this between buyer and seller? So much of it's just dependent on who needs to get the deal, the deal done. Um, it really depends on the deal. It really depends on the deal. I'd say there are certain fundamentals where just like if a seller, if there's a C-Corp target, it's usually the case that the shareholders just can't do the deal if it structures an asset purchase because it's so tax inefficient. So the seller just won't, it, it just won't be structured that way. Like the seller just can't have the deal structured that way. But if the target's an S corporation or an LLC, there really is often some negotiation that occurs regarding optimal structure. Um, it's usually fairly easy to, to find a structure that works for both parties. I'd say one of the bigger issues we see is with S corp targets. S corps are really finicky. An S corp can only have certain types of shareholders, specifically like US individuals. So if the buyer was a corporation or a partnership, like a fund, it, if it purchased the equity of an S corp, the S corp turns to a C corp automatically. And so it's typically not the case that buyers are going to want to buy the equity of an S corp. Um, and if you have any rollover sellers, they're not going to want it either. But there's a real, there can be a real tax efficiency for a seller of an S corp to sell the equity because again, they can get all long-term capital gains versus there's an asset sale portions ordinary income. And so sometimes there's negotiations around like a gross up and whether the buyer will gross up the seller for any tax leakage for not getting their optimal structure. And this can come into play with any number of transactions. Um transaction structures, but sellers will sometimes, depending on leverage, ask for gross ups to trans to do the transaction in a way that's tax advantageous for the buyer. So if the buyer wants a structure that's just not best for the seller, if the seller has some leverage, they can say, gross me up for the taxes that I will owe that are additional because of the structure you want. And the little tricky part there is because that gross up is actually additional deal consideration, what you really need is a gross up on the gross up because it's taxed. So it's an iterative calculation. So what you think might be in a million dollar difference in taxes can be like a $2 million gross up. Um, and so that could become a pretty um, big negotiating point in, in some transactions. How much of this is spelled out in the LOI? So it's a really great question. This is why I like to get involved very early in LOIs. So if I'm representing a seller, it really, for, I'll, I'll just say this, firstly, it really depends on who's negotiating, what the positions of the parties are, what the structures are, and what the big deal points are. Where it's something like there's going to, let's just take an easy example. There's going to be some contingent consideration in the form of equity. Sometimes we'll just put in a sentence that says, this will be structured in a manner that's tax efficient for the sellers, right? Or tax so that the equity is received on a tax deferred basis, right? And we'll just put in a sentence rather than figuring out exactly what the deal structure is going to be. Sometimes we'll figure out the whole deal structure because it's that important and it's that or it's that tricky, right? There's that many nuances or we know it's going to be because buyer isn't going to like what we need from a sale, seller's perspective. Um, sometimes. Uh, if we represent an S corporation target, 
we'll put in language that says, hey, if you want full basis step up on the assets and you're going to want an asset purchase, we're going to want to receive a gross up for the additional tax we'll have to pay because we didn't structure the transaction as a stock sale. And that'll be a sentence in there, but that's enough because if it's a really material point for the seller, you need to get it in there because it's you can't bring it up later. Hmm. Um, or it's hard to bring up later and win the point. So those are material issues you want to get in at the at the term sheet stage. I mean, I've had a client before where I've been, you know, they've come to the, the firm after they've signed an LOI and the term sheet has said, even though they're a C-Corp, that they're selling the assets of the corp. And although LOIs are often non-binding, like if it's, if the seller is already pregnant with the deal, are they already going to do it? Like you can't walk back from that after you agreed to it. It's really hard to renegotiate and still get the deal done. So, you know, you want to, you want to start talking about these issues early. I agree. But I also see the dynamics of leverage and negotiation where seller has more leverage pre LOI buyer has more leverage post LOI fair, fair to say. Yeah, that, that does often happen. And that's why you do again, want things in the term sheet. Um, yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't there be things you wouldn't want just because you, you, you know, that may, and I guess, depending on level of sophistication and who you're buying the business from, that you may not want it till you bring it up later the on. The buyer might not want it in there, right? Like buyers, we've seen many times where buyers really have the upper hand in the term sheet stage because they've dictated the structure and the sellers hasn't engaged counsel to help negotiate on those points. And then it's really like a buyer has said 25% of the deal consideration is completely contingent on these three guys working. And they can they end up with disproportionately more of that you know contingent consideration whatever it is. It's really hard to later negotiate different terms. And the terms that we're negotiating the term sheet might end up in some of the purchase price being compensation rather than uh, long term capital gain deal consideration. And it's really hard after you already have a signed LOI to say hold on that's not what I it's not what I thought I agreed to. That's going to be long term capital gains. It's like okay well that's not what you signed in the term sheet. You signed terms that just wouldn't result in that. It's hard to unpregnant a deal, but then how, how do you do it if you have to? I mean, I think again, it just goes to uh, who has the upper hand and at what point, right? Like if the management team decides that the structure just doesn't work for them and they're needed to operate the business going forward, buyer might be, much more inclined to negotiate those points than uh, if the sellers are, you know, or most of them aren't really needed <laughs> and um, the buyer has all the, the the leverage. Can you advise your client to play hardball, walk away and. All dependent, <laughs> right? Like each client decides I, what I can say is, and I, and I always have to remind myself this, you just need to give your client the information and some guidance, but ultimately a lot of these decisions are business level decisions you have to get, you have to help them have enough knowledge so they know what they're signing and understand the ramifications. Right. But ultimately a client might decide that even though it's not most tax efficient, it makes most sense to do a deal a certain way for other reasons. And that's okay too. Can we go back to QSBS and expand on that more? So QSBS stands for Qualified Small Business Stock. Um, and the ta the real tax benefits of QSBS is this. If you hold QSBS stock for more than five years, and then you sell that stock, you can uh, exclude from income tax the greater of $10 million or 10 times your basis in that stock. Okay? So simple example, if you invested $2 million into a C corporation and your stock qualified as QSBS stock. And six years later, you sold that stock. You can shield $20 million of that gain from tax, 2 million times 10 times your basis. That's the real benefit of QSBS is a total exclusion from tax. And that's now the the minimum was 10 million and then 10 X. Yeah, you get to exclude the greater of 
ten million dollars or ten times your basis. Okay, so like bootstrap from scratch, got it. Your founder, ten million dollars. Ten million. But if I threw in five million dollars, it could be up to fifty million. Yes. Okay, yes. I got it now. And yeah. there's a bunch of um, but not just not all stock and corporations is QSBS stock, right? Or you'd hear about this a lot more. QSBS is stock in a C corporation. So it has to be a C corporation. And it has to have been issued when the corporation was a qualified small business, meaning its aggregate gross assets at all times before the stock was issued and immediately after uh, the issuance does not exceed $50 million. And generally, aggregate gross assets for that purpose means cash and tax bases of the assets of the corporation. So you could, if you had a C corporation for, you know, new, new startup started as a C corporation. Um, and let's say it's operated for like a year or so. And let's say an investor decides to put in $3 million at a $65 million post money valuation. It still could be QSBS stock because that valuation is not the valuation used when when determining whether the aggregate gross assets of the company exceeds fifty million dollars, you look at instead the cash and the tax basis of the assets. So if you're an investor, you don't just rely on the pre or post money valuation for determining whether it's still a qualified small business. If it's, uh, it, you have to do a little more work to to figure it out. Um. When you have assets contributed to a corporation or if a, an LLC um, converts to a corporation, you have to use the fair market value of those assets when determining whether it's a qualified small business and whether the 50 million uh, if the 50 million um, value has been exceeded. The same so with S -corp? So S corps are really funky because if you own S corp stock, and then you convert your S corp to a C corp. You can't get QSBS because when you originally received the stock, it was S corp stock. So if you are a shareholder in an S corp and you want potential QSBS for your corp, we actually do a special type of reorganization to get you that stock tax efficiently. And that's a whole nother topic I'm happy to talk about, but it might be beyond the scope of this conversation. Um, but there's a way to make that happen um, so long as all the other requirements are met. But it, it's not as simple for that S-Corp founder as just converting to a C-Corp. Um, now, not only does the C-Corp stock have to be uh, acquired at original issuance, which means you have to have received your QSBS for an investment into the company. You can't have bought it in a secondary. It also can be disqualified if there have been any uh, significant redemptions within you know, the year prior or year after you've purchased your QSBS stock. So there's special disqualifying redemption rules you have to look at. Um, and then the corporation during substantially all of the holding period for the relevant shareholder and their stock of the corporation has to have met the active business requirement um, which means at least 80% by value of its assets needs to have been used in the active conduct of a qualified trader business. And the code defines by exclusion what a qualified trader business is. So basically it says what is not a qualified trader business is leasing, financing, investing, or similar businesses, businesses where the reputation or skill of the employee is the principal asset of the business, like law, health, consulting, those can't be QSBS businesses, um, or hotels, motels, or restaurants. So there's certain types of businesses that can't be QSBS businesses, but generally tech startups are okay because those are usually software as a surface business um, and technology businesses. Although the area, you know, can get a little gray if you have like a fintech business, which straddles technology and finance. Um, so th that's the quick and dirty on QSBS stock. So this is a big deal in uh, startup financing transactions. Why did the tax code get so complicated? It's a really great question. I don't know, but every year 
there's some, there's someone who's saying, I'm going to, I'm going to make it so the whole, your whole income tax return can be on one page. It's never going to happen. Right. Do politicians postcards. get file via postcard? Are there certain politicians that get paid for a tax law they put out there? I go, I don't. <laughs> is there quota to meet? Is that no, why there's so many of them? I don't know. It is very complicated, and there's a lot. There are a lot of um, but faults, right, and things you have to think about at every turn. But if you're well advised, you can save a lot of money. I agree. I agree. I'm always looking at the broader infrastructure and figure out where you can apply some lean agile models, I guess here, Leslie. Um, how many people do you see relocate prior to their exit for a tax savings? Yeah, it's an interesting question. But specifically to Texas and Florida. We have a lot of clients who have relocated to uh, Texas and Florida in the past couple of years. Um, you know, certain states have provisions that claw back on the savings one could have by moving to a different state. Um, and some of it's dependent on what portion, you know, how contingent the further payments are, if they're doing it between signing, you know, sorry, if they're doing, if they're moving after they've gotten their original closing consideration, but before a contingent payout has been made. Um, we do see people try to move. That's something we see. I don't know. We also see people move back because they don't they didn't actually want to live <laughs> in Florida or Texas. Okay, so that's a big personal consideration. Uh, I'd say more often than people moving before an M&A event, we're just seeing people wanting to move for you know, for just general tax savings on their everyday um income. I mean, we're seeing a lot of that. Like people are just sick of not getting the benefit of the SALT deduction. And we're seeing a lot of people just move saying that that's the reason they're moving, not necessarily because they had a big deal coming to fruition, although we've seen that as well. And in that circumstance, we have, I have a colleague who advises on um, all the ways to make sure that you're actually giving up state tax residency because these states are aggressive. Yeah, how far decide. ahead do I, I need to do that? This is all top of mind while I'm taking this call from Miami today. Yeah, no, you have to really, you have to really move to get any benefits from actually moving. Um, but yeah, you usually have to do it before, uh, oftentimes, and it's really state specific. But you usually have to do it before you have like a signed deal, or um, yeah, you usually have to do it before you have a deal. And you and you have to like establish a residency. You, you have to have time to establish the residency. Really Go over there, rent an apartment, then go sign the deal. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't really work that way. You're going to probably subject yourself to an audit that you're not going to win. Okay. I appreciate that uh, insight there. In terms of diligencing for the tax considerations as a buy side, what are the big ticket items that I, as a deal person, should be asking about ahead of time just to understand what some of those things are? Yeah. So part of this, again, depends on the structure, right? So if you're buying equity in an entity, you're assuming tax liabilities, right? If you buy the stock of a C-Corp, whatever tax issues that C-Corp has travels to you as owner of the company. Now, you might have indemnifications or rep and warranty insurance to cover yourself financially, but it's still your headache, right? Now, if you're instead just doing an asset purchase, a little bit less of it, your headache, what tax issues are at the, tar the target company, that's the seller, right? Because those, those issues should primarily stay with the selling entity in an asset purchase, except maybe some state and local taxes. Um, and if you're acquiring equity in an LLC or S, S Corp, some of those pre-existing taxes will could naturally flow through somewhat to the prior owners, but still kind of your headache because you own the company. Um, so you always want, if you can, if it makes sense, given the deal to do fulsome diligence. I mean, that's always my recommendation is fulsome tax diligence. You have an accounting firm come in and actually diligence the company, look at all its tax returns and make sure it's been doing everything correctly. Um, and so we always do recommend fulsome tax diligence. Bring in the experts. Bring in the experts, get it done. Yep. Yeah. 
And as like law firms don't do the tax diligence, usually it's an accounting firm. Um, and then the accounting firm typically will put together a due diligence report, like a tax due diligence report. And then the lawyers will look at that to figure out um, what are going to be, what are the big ticket issues that need to be negotiated on the tax side. And we'll decide what needs to make it into the purchase agreement as far as obligations of buyer and seller with respect to taxes um, and any cleanup that needs to be done or indemnity that ask, needs to be asked for. Any big do's and don'ts, lessons learned from experience? Do get a tax advisor involved early on. It just saves you, it, pretend, it saves you a lot of money later on, right? And it's the juice is worth the squeeze. I'd always say get a tax advisor um, involved just to make sure you are structuring the transaction tax efficiently. Um, and then as a buyer, do your diligence on the target company. That'd be my big buyer uh, advice. And then another just piece of advice, I guess, for sellers, not, you know, if you, if there's a target company and some of the sellers are going to be rolling and like have equity in the buyer going forward or equity in the target going forward and some are selling, their interests are not always going to be aligned. So sometimes, um, depending on what's, what, the, how the deal negotiations are, are proceeding, those, sh those rollover, uh, shareholders or equity holders might need special counsel. Like sometimes we counsel management teams of private equity portfolio companies and represent the management team specifically in negotiating their rollover and their incentive equity that they're to receive for go forward services once the company has been purchased by the private equity fund. Yeah, I like that. Think of the broader stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Yep. What's the most creative strategy you ever seen to avoid paying taxes? Like, you know, sub entities in Bermuda, like what, what's the most creative? I mean, the IRS has done a pretty good job shutting down uh, anything that would be a tax shelter. So I haven't seen anything crazy um, as far as structuring. I just say I've seen smart structuring, right? People who can structure smartly do well. Um, and then that, again, goes to typically just structuring as a seller to get most of your gain as long-term capital gain. Uh, if you need to, structuring into the PTET deductions that we now have available. Um, and also, really importantly, structuring your go-forward incentive equity tax efficiently. So I wouldn't say there's any real uh tips for there. sheltering the gain but i'd say you can structure efficiently and then we set up trust in wyoming <laughs> i would say this as um if you're a founder of a startup or you are a shareholder of a earlier stage company you should start thinking about overall tax structuring for you and your family right like thinking smartly about how to use trusts and grats and, and eventual estate planning uh, can pay off. So um, that goes again to why sellers in particular should get tax involved really early is because you do need to start thinking about some of those tax efficient structuring, uh, those tax efficient, efficient structurings earlier on rather than at the time you're trying to sign an LOI. Because some of it is, it's a little too late to get into some of the tax efficient structures once you've signed an LOI and have a real valuation on the table. This has been great. I'm glad you took the time. Um, for those of you tuned in, thanks for getting this far. You got a lot. This has been great. I learned a lot. I'm, yeah, I'll let people know if uh, anybody needs some tax advice, I'm going to send them your way or anybody reaches out to Leslie, tell her you picked her up from MA Science. She'll give you. 10% yes. off of uh, <laughs> engagement letters and a little, uh -huh. we'll have an MA science discount code. And then, uh, yeah. um, I, I'm proud of anyone who made it this far. <laughs> they, yeah, you're crazy. You get, that's your reward you get. <laughs> <gasps> Leslie, thank you so much for joining us. Those of you still tuned in till next time. Here's to the deal.